Hey Booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Um, it is an early evening here in the outskirts of Denver, way out in the plains. In front of the Front Range, it is 73 degrees. It's supposed to be 75 today. It's gorgeous. Um, I love having the, uh, the daylight savings times and, you know, now I can enjoy the, the daylight longer. So after I get off work, um, I've got time to not only make a video and still all bright out and then I get to go out into the yard, play with the dogs, enjoy the day. I've got daisies looking out the window here. She's huffing and puffing at the neighbors. The window's open. It's just gorgeous. So, um, this is another informal chatty video, guys. I realize, um, I made one of these a couple weeks ago called, um, What I'm Reading Now, uh, Finished Books and, and, uh, What I'm Reading Now, you know, Finished and Books in Progress. That was the name. So I'm probably going to change the name of this just slightly because I've got a little bit of this and that. I just feel like, uh, doing a, a mis miscellany, as Lukash might say, miscellany or a miscellany type of video, but um, just wanted to give you an update on some of the books I have been reading. Uh, some of these books I won't be able to show you because they were um, ebooks or PDFs. Daisy, she's getting ready to lose her mind. There's some children, <coughs> children walking by. <coughs> One moment. Yes, she was barking at our next door neighbor, um, Asher. Hi, Asher. Um, he's out playing because it's gorgeous out and she has to bark at people. That's what Daisy does. Um, <laughs> Daisy D's the bee. You know what I'm saying? No, you can't get on the chair with me. Now she's all hangdog like she knows she's in trouble. Um, <laughs> so where was I before I was so rudely interrupted? Um, yes, so these books are books I have finished... Some I, I won't be able to show you. Like I said, they were on PDFs or eBooks, but uh, I'll mention the names. They're mostly like indie books. Um, I do a lot of book reviewing for independent authors, um, usually in the realm of like thrillers, um, sometimes some nonfiction or historical fiction, but I've been getting a lot of thrillers lately. Um, but there are some winners here that I recently finished. And my reviews will be forthcoming. They haven't they have not published yet, but I've already written them and filed them. Um, so let's start, I guess, with the books I have finished. Uh, and I know that Patrice over at Two Minutes uh, on Books uh, showed this recently. We read this together, and I still need to, I still owe you my message on Boxer, <laughs> Patrice, for the final chapter. Um, but you're finished. Um, but I'm finished as well. I just need to record that message. But this is The Great War and the Birth of Modern Medicine by Thomas Helling, MD, A History. I highly recommend this book. Um, this man, for being an MD, not that that precludes anyone from writing really well, <laughs> but he just had this heart and soul and uh, just poetry sometimes, the way he would des describe Oh, the different procedures, and then the suffering, and then the the passion that these doctors had for innovation. Um, Patrice and I both were just really struck by just his his mastery of of prose writing. It was amazing. So uh, the Great War and the Birth of Modern Medicine um, by Thomas Helling. Highly recommend this book. Uh, this is out by Pegasus Books. So uh, this, put this on your radar. See if it's at your library. Um, I wonder if it's still available on HamiltonBook.com. Luckily, I always have that window open on my computer, guys. So uh, let me do the searching for you. <laughs> I am like a bot when it comes to book uh, finding books at the best prices. Uh, I... I it's taken a lifetime to acquire these skills. Yes, they do have it at Hamilton Book, you guys, right now. Um, I'll put the link in the description box below for hamiltonbook.com. It's $9.95. Okay, so it's not like a super cheap, but um, it's regularly $32. So it's a $10 book. 
uh, brand new. These are not used books in Hamilton book. So you might have a remainder mark on it and that's about it. They're all new. Um, all right, so let's move on to books I finished and then, I'll, yes, then we're doing the books that I have, uh, yeah, okay. Next, ooh, now this book I showed you in the last, um, the last video that I was currently reading, but I have finished it and I've already posted my review of it. Um, this is really good. This is The Unvanquished uh, by Patrick K. O'Donnell. He wrote The Indispensables, which I still want to read at some point. This is the untold story of Lincoln's special forces, the manhunt for Mosby's Rangers and the, or Mosby's Rangers and the Shadow War that forged America's special operations. A very long subtitle. Um, this is, I would consider this a must have for anyone interested in, like me, I'm a Civil War buff, and this, you know, it kind of covers it. And, well, it, not kind of, it, this is a highly detailed book. Um, at some points, it, you might slog through a lot of minutia, but um, overall, I like the way he kind of jumps around. Um, so it's not strictly chronological, and then he's moving back and forth between Mosby and the Confederate movements, and then it jumps over to Union cavalry and the different uh, commanders of the different like little segments of special ops cavalry that were tasked with like hunting him down. Then there were a bunch of other different movements and battles, but uh, I loved, um, I really liked it. It might be considered, um, you know, really detailed in a, like a military movement. It's not like on the order of a casemate book by any means, but um, he leaves no stone unturned as the cliche goes. Uh, so I really enjoy Patrick K. O'Donnell's The Unvanquished. Um, again, uh, I don't know. If you, I don't think I need to read you the back of the cover here. I, I did that in the other video. Um, what I'll try to do is, like I said with this series, I want to kind of do it every couple of weeks to catch you up on what I've, what I've accomplished, what I've read. Um, so if anything, I might just link back to, I might make a playlist actually. That could be something as I make more of these videos. Um, so you can go back and if you want to learn more about the book or it takes you two seconds just to type it in on your computer and, and you get the full, rather than me reading you all this, who wants that? I'm trying to learn <laughs> to make more exciting. Um, hi, Roxy, more exciting uh, programming. Now she's looking for the bed. Are you going to get in there with Daisy? Give the viewers what they want. Get in with your friend. Get in with your... Si One moment while I arrange her bed. Oh, my gosh. Okay. She's in this brown bed down here, and I threw a blanket over her. If you have chihuahuas, you know that they love blankets. It could be 89 degrees outside. She's starting to poke her little head out. I don't think you're, you're catching her. Where Are you there? I see the nose. There's Daisy, and then there's Roxy in the foreground. We'll try to do it like that. Anyway, as you can see, this is a very informal video. I just thought, hey, ball cap, Detroit Lions, and my Detroit Tigers are 5-0, and undefeated. Um, they've never had a, such a strong start in baseball in many, many years. All right, so we've got these two books. Um, I also finished this little volume. I... I recently posted on uh, my review on my social media channels. I reviewed this for Book Browse Review. This is Beverly Hills Spy, the double agent war hero uh, who helped Japan attack Pearl Harbor by Ronald Drabkin. Now, the subtitle makes it seem like he was far more uh, at cause. You know what I mean? Like, like he... Um, who helped Japan attack Pearl Harbor. Well, that's a very broad kind of meaning. Um, he was a consultant for them uh, right after World War I. The Japanese were really trying to pick up a lot of the aviation experts um, who had flown who had flown aircraft off of the, the prototypes of aircraft carriers in World War I. And this man, Frederick Rutland, he was a British... Um, pilot, World War I pilot. Um, they call him the father of the modern aircraft car 
uh, aircraft carrier. Um, but so he consulted with them and showed them how to build in, in the interwar years, mostly right after World War I. Um, he kind of revealed to them his, his know-how, his stuff. So, you know, so the years go by and as there is, as Japan's are like, you know, ramping up for uh, just going on, you know, ramping up for a confrontation with the U.S., you know. Uh, they realized, the Navy realized, we need aircraft carriers. That's what's going to win this next war. And they're like, oh, what about that guy we talked to uh, back then? And so they actually, like, rang him up after he had already gone back home to England, was, you know, was a successful businessman, married, kids. Um, and, but then he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll work for you because I'm not getting promoted because people say I'm too too old to be in the RAF, you know. Um, and here's our Frederick Rutland right there at the top. Yeah, he flew. The, he was he was he was kind of a a badass, but um, he had a hankering for a lavish lifestyle. He liked to be in the public eye, um, but he was fearless when it came to uh, just aircraft landings at sea. Here's a great photo of him um, landing his Sopwith pup on the small front deck of HMS um, Furious. And uh, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about just how aircraft carriers evolved. I mean, it's not a super in-depth book, but it gives you kind of a taste of what the changes that were going on within the Navy between World War One and World War II. Um, so it's interesting. Um, again, I, I've written a, a full review at Book Browse and um, just head over to any one of my social media channels. You see, you'll see the thumbnail for this and a link. Um, my Facebook history shelf page has is, is got the more, more direct link to Book Browse. So um, check it out there. Um, but I liked it. So he became known right after World War One because he fought, uh, he actually flew the first plane successfully off an aircraft carrier in the Battle of Jutland. So his last name was Rutland. So you know what happened. He became a hero and everyone back in England called him, he was known as Rutland of Jutland. Um, but but by, by the time as, as of like 1939, 1940, uh, Frederick Rutland kind of became a Butland. <laughs> Frederick Rutland the, uh, was a Butland. Um, no, he um, he was definitely passing secrets to the Japanese um, and then trying to cover it up by saying, well, I didn't, you know, I look, what do I have to do with anything? I'm a British citizen, you know? Um, and so we, and then you have like... Um, the FBI, the CIA, and then the British, S the SOE. Um, Drabkin kind of goes into detail about how they, they weren't really communicating. And in fact, the British were keeping it from the American intelligence services that they were following this guy. They, they kind of copped on to him early on, and they were always watching him. Um, but it's a slim little volume, and the writer has like a direct link in some cases to this story. He said his father and grandfather were both in... Um, was it U.S. intelligence, counterintelligence? And uh, he says he's one degree removed from most people in the story. So um, it, it was a really enjoyable uh, read. And again, I'd never heard of Frederick uh, Rutland, Rutland of Jutland. Uh, so that was really good. I can recommend it if you're in for like a little World War II espionage kind of true story and learning something you never knew before. That's a, a great book. Um what else have I finished? Ooh, yes. This one is, I don't know if I've shown this in my New History on the Horizon. I think I did. Um, this this book comes out this month, actually, and I've written a review of it for Shelf Awareness. It has not appeared yet. Um, what day does this come out? April 16th. This was so good. Uh, this was so, so good. Um, I'd like to get a finished copy of this when I can, but this is The Wide, Wide Sea. Imperial Ambition, First Contact, and the Fateful Final Voyage of Captain James Cook by Hampton Sides, who also wrote The Ghost Soldiers. And in The Kingdom of Ice, um, he wrote, he's written a bunch of stuff. Um, 
also, I think I showed this before to you. Um, rather than read the back, well, and I don't want to give away my review because I, you know, I've that is someone's commissioned me for it, so I don't want to share too much on that side of it. Just stay tuned on my social media. Uh, you can read my uh, my uh, my review of it. But what am I hearing out there? I'm hearing ghost sounds, guys. Um, this one was great. Um, it details his final voyage. Um, it's making me want to go back and open up my, my big biography of James Cook by Beak. Was it Beagle? Beaglethorpe? Um, it's got a fantastic bibliography. I just, there's so much to choose from in here. Like, Wow. It has, this has everything. It has just lush descriptions of all the different islands that they landed on. It's like anthropology, it kind of revealed Cook's anthropological side, how he, he never really judged um, the indigenous peoples that he came across. He was always just documenting in his journal what he was witnessing. He never like was, you know, passing judgment, which I found refreshing. He seemed interested and these people and their different cultures. Um, but the other thing that um, Hampton Sides brings out in this is that people had noticed that Cook was different on this final journey. And that could have led to what happened. Um, he was far more mercurial. And he suggests it could have been maybe rheumatism. Um, but something was definitely different. He would have these moments where he was really harsh with his crew. Um, and that his decision making was uh, a bit compromised in this final journey. Maybe he was just tired. Maybe he was just just tired of doing it. Who knows? But um, it's a page turner. It's just so you know full of adventure, swashbuck swashbuckling, and and everything else. Uh, loved it. So this comes out April sixteenth um, from Doubleday Books. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for my review on shelf awareness should be up. They usually try to post it around the day of the publication, so that's actually probably going to be, um, what, another couple weeks. Uh, okay, so this is fiction that I finished reading. Oh, and I have some exciting news. I don't know whether to tell you this now or surprise you later. Uh, <laughs> when it actually happens. Um, I finished reading. For, um, I'm writing a review for Historical Novels Review of Jeff Shara's latest, The Shadow of War, a novel of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I've already filed that review. Um, it'll come out in the... Oh, God, what, what issue are we looking at? May. It'll be in the May 2024 issue of Historical Novels Review. Um, I've always been a big fan of Jeff Shara's, um, you know, not every book is like knocks it out of the park, but he's a very solid writer, um, I find, and I, I, I appreciate his ability to write historical fiction that is um, accurate. It gets to the essence of things, and he, but he doesn't like overuse uh, a lot of like. I don't want to sound prudish or anything. I'm not, but. Um, he has it like he's one of those authors that has a cleaner way of like uh, detailing war. It's it can be very uh, graphic, but like every other word, it's not like you know just an f bomb. You know, I think I might have seen a, maybe a couple of things in uh, the Frozen Hours when he wrote about the Battle of Chosin Reservoir in the Korean War. Um, so, because you want to have some type of realism there, you don't want to have like you know, Quakers talking in war. But at the same time, um, he just knows how to tell a story without having to, to be, to be um, you know, foul-mouthed about it. So <laughs> I don't know why I'm picking that. But, uh, but he also has a, a, a feel of characters, and I think he does a good job. I'm not going to give away too much of this. I, we know how it ends, right? Um, but it was an inter interesting choice of how he used a few different perspectives to tell the story, um, and I will be interviewing Jeff Shara for this channel uh, later this month, and so um, I'll be interviewing this month, 
but we're going to release the interview around the time of this, uh, when this publishes, which will be in May. So May 14th, this comes out. So stay tuned in a couple months. Going to have another author interview, which I'm very excited for. It's been a while. Um, and he's just one of my favorites. I'm like kind of like a little excited to be talking to the man directly. Ah, wish me luck. Uh, all right. So I'm going to finish that. Ooh. And here's a... a I was lucky enough to get a, a physical copy of this, mostly with the independent authors that I review. I get just ebooks or PDFs. But they sent me, I was actually able to get a hard copy of this that I just posted a review about on my social media. Uh, I reviewed this for a book trip, and I was really impressed. This was a really great debut. It's considered like a political thriller, um, but it's the first in a new series, so I'm looking forward to it. This was Louisiana Hydra by Gregory Ryman, a Stinson Borden novel. Um, again, check out my social media to see uh, to be led to links to Book Trip to read my in-depth review of this book. Um, since I haven't told you about this before, oh, and this just um, released on Monday, I believe. So this is available now. Uh, William Stinson is considered the stuff of legend in the international hacking community, and his employment with the CIA is a closely guarded secret. He lives a secluded life, but not on this day. He is enjoying a coffee on a quiet patio at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Stephanie Borden is a high-priced international consultant who has been called to a meeting with Senator Michael Glenway to discuss the recent disappearance of a whistleblower who was preparing to break his silence. He had discovered an active threat against the U.S. that employed a strategy that few could fully comprehend. Borden and Glenway met on a patio at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., right next to a man sitting alone, quietly reading a book. Neither Stinson nor Borden realized what had happened as the first bullet struck the senator. However, there was no doubt when the second bullet ended the senator's life, and in that moment, Stinson and Borden were thrown together in a race to not only save their own lives, but to unravel a conspiracy that would start in a tavern in Oxford, England, make its way through the streets of Paris, France, and then finally cut a path down through the muddy waters of the Mississippi to Louisiana. Uh, Stinson is accustomed to the insidious nature of those who plan and execute these types of crimes. However, for Borden, the evil she must face as they unravel this mystery threatens to drag her into a darkness she may be incapable of returning from, and time is running out. This one was smart. This, there was a really smart plot going on here that was actually quite alarming because you could see it actually unfolding um, in the present day society. Um, it, he's got this Gregory Ryman. Wow. Um, he knows a lot about not only just hacking uh, the tech that he refers to in these, uh, I mean, it, it's really, it, it's engrossing. It's, it's, um, it's quite fascinating and absorbing. Um, but, um, these two, these two are very different people. But he, he's just, he keeps to the, uh, the plot very, very closely, and he's always adding in something else, something more, that you're just like, holy crap. I mean, we've got a lot going on here. There's, there's, um, there's smuggling, there's um, data collection, there's um, privacy issues, there's uh, China. I mean, it's got it all, really, and I'm really, and it ends with a really big, Wow, not expecting it. So, Louisiana Hydra, a very promising debut for a new series that I look forward to reading the next uh, installment of. So, check it out. See where you can pick it up, uh, maybe at your library, at the bookstore, or, or online. But I really liked it, and I've written a review, so it's out there. Check it out. Um, okay. Okay, and yes... Two more books that I've read, and then we'll we'll push on into what I'm currently reading. I also posted this on social media. Another standout independent author. Um, she, but she has several. Uh, she's written a lot of historical fiction, but she has just come to my attention. 
and I was just blown away. It's a very big book. It's over 500 pages. So when I started to read this, because um, I'm, re I, you know, was slated to review it for book trip, I was like, oh Lord, 500 pages. I was like, please, please be good. Please be good. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes it can be hard. I was like, how have I not heard of this woman? Her writing is fantastic. And she's, she's got a historian's um, grasp of large and small events. And she weaves them into really well-drawn characters. This is Bridge to Tomorrow. It's a, it's a series called Bridge to Tomorrow. And this is the first in the trilogy. It's called Cold Peace. And the author is Helena P. Schrader. The trilogy is all about the Berlin airlift which I don't really know a lot about. You know, I know what it was, what happened, mostly. Wow, this really takes you in deep and on the ground into uh, post, post-war post Berlin. And, the, you know, the city in 1948 is still, uh, people are still struggling to live. There's hardly any electricity after a certain time. You've got the four, the four allies that are... Um, uh, dividing up Berlin into the occupation zones um and then it just I love I love the the characters are based on some of the some real people and then she moves into just the uh I like how she kind of moves from um, place to place she introduces her characters and and she kind of like American sector. And now we're moving on to this section over here. Um, as the different characters, um, you know, she's got like, let me, I'll just tell you, I'll read this to you again. Um, Europe, 1948, a continent humbled by rationing, unemployment, and Soviet tanks. In the ruins of Hitler's capital, the currency is worthless too. People live from handouts or turn to crime and prostitution. Uh, a Battle of Britain Ace a female air traffic controller, um, a concentration camp survivor, and an ex-ATA woman pilot are just some of those trying to find their place in the post-war world. An air ambulance service offers a shimmer of hope, but when a Soviet fighter brings, brings down a British passenger liner, Berlin becomes a flashpoint that it could explode into World War III. And boy, does she bring that home. Uh, I did not know that all these things happened. Um, and she has, this woman, Helena P. Schrader, this author and historian, she has earned a PhD in modern history from the University of Hamburg. Um, and she has written about this before um, in the Blockade Breakers, which was a, compreh a comprehensive study of the Berlin Airlift released by History Press in 2008. So again, this is her new trilogy. Um, her other two books uh, during this time frame. I, and I think a couple of the p characters that are in this book appeared in, in a couple of her other books before, like Where Eagles Never Flew, a Battle of Britain novel, and then Moral Fiber, a bomber pilot story. So some of these characters move into this story. But it's so, ex it's so, um, it's so generous. It's an expansive novel that I feel like I'm reading history, though, as these people are coming in and out. They're having dialogue. Um, and then... I, she just sets up the tension, you know, the, the Soviets are starting to act not like allies anymore, but like enemies. So, and then the Germans, which you think they would be the enemies, are turning into allies uh, of the, you know, the British and the Americans. So it's so well done, you guys. I really, really enjoyed this, and I can't wait for the next book. The next book in the uh, trilogy is going to be called Cold War. Um, this one ends right as uh, the Soviets decide to blockade and just shut off uh, the other the other allies from Eastern Berlin. They, they just basically shut it off so that a bunch of people, not a bunch, we're talking millions of people, were just um, cut off. 2.2 million civilians were cut off from food, fuel, electricity, and all other necessities of life. Yeah, they imposed a blockade on the western sectors of Berlin. So, um, so in the next book, they're going to really be kicking it off, like with how they're going to supply those people. Um, but really great. I really like this book. So, yeah, that was a win. And then, oh, I can't recommend this book enough. 
this is out now i believe hang on let me let me double check um yes this one because i have a finished copy so sometimes it's hard for me to tell oh it's not yet published when's it coming out oh april, okay april 16th get this on your radars guys um I'm waiting for this review to also publish with shelf awareness but this is muse of fire world war one as seen through the lives of the soldier poets by michael corda you might recognize the name he has written a biography on robert e lee he has written um a bunch of different things but yeah oh, this was so good this was so good um I never get tired of reading about World War One and and the soldier poets. Uh, this one's different in that he he includes two that were who did, let's put it this way, you know they they would be framed as the pro war people, the pro war guys, um, but they didn't live long enough to become disillusioned. Is basically what Corda kind of argues, um, but like Rupert Brooke. You know, he died in 1916. Is it 1916 or 15? It was early on, and, he, and, and it wasn't in battle. But if he had gone into battle in Gallipoli, he most likely would have died because uh, he was like a lieutenant. So he would have been at the front. Um, and then there's Alan Seeger, who was an American, but joined the French Foreign Legion. Um, and he was, you know, writing poetry that was... Uh, you know, just still kind of looking at the the heroics of things. But yeah, um, but the, the rest of the usual suspects are here. Um, Siegfried, Siegfried Sassoon, Robert Graves, Wilford Owen. And then, yeah, Isaac Rosenberg was really different. He was a guy that was like, none of this is good. <laughs> he was just like, no, I have no choice but to join. You know, it kind of looks at the lower class and how they were kind of forced to fight, you know. Um, and they knew it was BS, for lack of a kinder way of saying it. But uh, Muse of Fire, World War One is seen through the lives of soldier poets. My review coming forth with from Shelf Awareness. But I really do recommend this book. April 16th. Comes out. Oh, I know. I have one more to show you. This review... Uh, is in the final stages of editing and this will be running hopefully in the next week or two with book browse review where I do an in-depth a long-form review and I also wrote a beyond the book article um, and I am going to be getting a finished copy of this I've talked to the publicist because um, this is just fantastic Wow, you guys. This book comes out, oh, it already did come out, so we're a little bit behind the, um, um, but I know everyone's been talking about it. Um, this is put out by Bellevue Literary Press. It's published on March 12th. Um, this is Flight of the Wild Swan by Melissa Pritchard. Uh, again, I can't wait to get the uh, the final, the finished copy. Um, this was all about Florence Nightingale. This was a, a shimmering singing novel about Florence Nightingale. And now I just want to find the best biography on her. Um, I, I, I just was blown away. And again, my long form review will go into some of the just the, the prose in here is beautiful. She basically used a lot. She was reliant on... Florence Nightingale's letters and journals, uh, letters from um, some of her, you know, her friends, her family, but um, but how she imagines the interiority of Nightingale's life, her thinking, her her calling. Um, like there's a Joan of Arc moment in here, you know, when she when she believes she was called by God to ease the suffering of the world. So, um, 
it's an interesting structure too because you've got very short pages so, and then some are just like lists uh checklists or then you have like journal entries her commonplace book like the household notes um she moves through her life very quickly through these type of uh just brief um, and they go into different parts you know uh it's just so beautiful and florence nightingale comes across as just this woman who is just kicking against the fetters of a uh, patriarchal and hidebound society and British society that just didn't look down on nursing and thought it, it, it wasn't becoming of a young a woman of a middle to upper middle class in Britain to to deal with you know the the, the poor the, the the diseased thing but Florence sought that out she was drawn to suffering in a way that most of us can't understand. Um, some of these these uh, scenes are just amazing, and they're drawn from real life um, based off of her journals, letters, and, you know, just what her family can remember about her. But she, um, she sought out the suffering, and she was not afraid to, to, to confront that head on. And so the section on the Crimean War where she became famous as the lady with the lamp or whatever uh, was just, uh, it was, it was gut wrenching to read, but Melissa Pritchard. Wow. All I can say is guys, I think you would really enjoy this novel. This is historical fiction at its finest. It's very literary, um, but enjoyable to read. <laughs> so you can't say that often about like literary works, you know, sometimes they're too precious for their own good, but this one was just a, a fantastic read. I read it in a weekend. It's a 400 page book. I read it in a weekend. That's how good it was. Okay. I didn't have to force myself to, you know, complete a reading project. I just loved it. Um, okay. Now, what are we reading now? Peggy is reading Vagabonds by Oscar Jensen. I am reviewing this for Washington Independent Review of Books. I'll be writing that review this weekend. I'm almost done. Eh, a little less than 100 pages to go. Um, I know that Johnny Keene had shown this book on his channel. Um, uh, let me read this to you real quick. London, 1857. A pair of teenage girls holding a sign that says, Fugitive slaves ask for money on the corner of Blackman Street. After a constable accosts them and charges them with begging, they end up in court where national newspapers pick up their story. Are the girls truly escaped slaves from Kentucky? Or will the city's dystopian mendicity society catch them in a lie, exposing them as born and raised Londoners and endangering their safety? With its many stories of people like these who lived and made their living on the streets, Vagabonds forms a moving picture of the real Dickensian London, piecing together contemporary sources such as newspaper articles, letters, and journal entries. Historian Oscar Jensen follows the harrowing, hopeful journeys of the city's poor. Children, immigrants, street performers, thieves, and sex workers, all diverse in gender, ethnicity, ability, and origin. In their own voices, they reveal the true character of this place and time, with its deep inequality that bears an astonishing resemblance to our own era's divides. Um, and it is exactly what it says it is. It's a, it's a human story, and um, there's a lot of different stories that come up in here. Uh, he kind of ranges all over the place, but he kind of brackets, brackets them in, uh, into um, distinct buckets. Boys, girls, infants, uh, the professional, like street livers, street hustlers, renegades, uh, the elderly. Um, so he kind of breaks it down into those large um, categories. But I am trying to finish this one. Well, I will finish this one. Um, today's Thursday. Yeah, so I got to finish that up. Um, Another book I'm reading right now is on my Kindle, so it's not here, but it is another independent novel. It's called The Canticle of Ibiza. We'll see how that turns out. Um, and this is quite the academic work. Uh, this is due next week, and I've got a lot of reading to do before then. 
Um, this woman's name looks familiar to me. I feel like I've either read something by hers or I want to get a book. Um, anyway, I'm 50 pages in <laughs> to a, uh, boy, 450 page book. And it's, it's quite dense, but, um, I'm trying to, to figure out the, the connecting ties on this, this story here, but uh, it is The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic, Reconstruction, 1860 to 1920, by Manisha Sinha. Uh, this is uh, put out by Nort, no, Live Right, Live Right, which is an imprint of Norton, W.W. W. Norton. I'm so sorry, I don't know where that came from. Uh, yeah, this one kind of got assigned to me only a month in advance. Usually I'm getting books from this particular pu uh, publication that I write reviews for. I get uh, books that are, won't be publishing for months and months and months. But this one came on the radar and uh, it just kind of dropped on everyone's laps. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's already out. Isn't it? Okay, I got I to gotta take a look. I got to take a look. Uh, because I feel like it would have already been, I haven't seen it in the other, uh, places that I normally see it. Well, no, it, it came out. Okay. It just came out there, March 26th. So today's April 4th. So it's been out about a week. All right. So I've got a, yeah, my review is due early next week. Um, let me give you a quick synopsis um yeah should i read from here we are told that the present moment bears a strong resemblance to reconstruction when freed people and the federal government attempted to create an interracial democracy in the south after the civil war that effort was overthrown and serves as a warning today about violent backlash to the mere idea of black equality. Um, in this book, acclaimed historian Manisha Sinha expands our view beyond the usual temporal and spatial bounds of Reconstruction, uh, which technically lasted from 1865 to 77, to explain how the Civil War, the overthrow of Reconstruction, the conquest of the West, labor conflict in the North, Chinese exclusion, women's suffrage, and the establishment of an overseas American empire were part of the same struggle between the forces of democracy and those of reaction. So highlighting the critical role of black people and redefining American citizenship and governance, Sena's book shows that reconstruction laid the foundation <clears throat> of our democracy. Um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. So uh, it's, there's a lot. These are very thin pages. And so there's a lot going on in here. Um, but I've read a lot of different books about reconstruction lately that have come out. And um, I don't deny that re reconstruction, you know, it completely failed when they pulled the federal troops out. And yeah, it's a sad realization that I've come to over over the years about the Civil War. You know, most of my life being a Civil War buff um, and believing in the Union cause and from being from the North, um, I was always like, you know, you lost, get over it, right? When you see those rebel flags and the Confederate you know, sympathizers and or even just people trying to uh, make the case for that, you know, oh, slavery didn't cause the Civil War, it was states' rights, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the more I've read and, and been really studying Reconstruction, I've gotten really angry because I, I realize that in, in, in a big way, the North didn't win the Civil War. You know, the, the Union I don't know, I'm to say a Pyrrhic victory in the sense of that our ideals, uh, 
it, it just makes me angry that all those lives that were, you know, lost. Um, the failure of reconstruction to really reconstruct and demand that the South and the people we were letting back in, you know, to abide by these principles of equality before the law. Um, everyone was just in a rush to like make, you know, kiss and make up, you know, the reconciliation forces in the North. They were just tired of it. And I, I get they were they were drained. That whole cataclysm they lived through, I get it. They just wanted things to to be better, but they made them so much worse. And it pisses me off, frankly. <laughs> because the lost cause, you know, people, the Confederates that came back and then just created this myth. Uh, it pisses me off. Because in a way they won. And they were able to get their foot back in the door and then just try to, you know, um, yeah, slavery was abolished, but they found other ways to make people's lives hell and, and put them in the top position and and still have their foot on everyone else's throats, you know, um, on the um, on black people's throats. And it was just, you know, it's just disgusting. So the scholarship is really revealing lately that what a tragedy a national tragedy that Reconstruction wasn't allowed to finish its work. <sighs> yeah, makes me mad. Anyway, I'm reading this right now, and I got to finish this by Monday. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm finishing that up. I'm finishing Vagabonds. I've got um, that novel I'm reading, and then I've got to start reading a very large book that I'm also reviewing for Book Browse Review. It's going to be a mega bestseller. I was able to land the book, but it's 500 pages of reading, so that's due on 420, of all things. <laughs> so, April 20th. So I got to get going on that. And I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more books as well uh, for review. I've got more. There's always something in the pipeline here at the History Shelf. Um, I just want to show you real t quick. This is a long video, but again, it's just chatty. I'm just kind of thinking out loud to you guys. Some some fun history magazines that have come in the mail lately. I wanted to um, sing the praises of this the best Civil War magazine out there, the Civil War Monitor. Um, it is a it is a quarterly. This one was from Winter. But um, I love the designs. I love how they're just they're so fresh. Uh, and of course, I love reading about these two guys. They were best friends. That's uh, General James Longstreet and my guy, Ulysses Grant. Um, these are wonderfully designed magazines. Um, that's not even the best. Um, like big full page photographs. I love Civil War Monitor. Um, I love how they kind of colorize these these photos and um it's it's a great magazine if you're interested in the civil war and you're not a subscriber i highly recommend it uh, oh yeah john bell hood why the long face <laughs> why the long face john bell hood sorry that was too easy um where are these guys where are the friends and foes here oh i love this <laughs> This is photoshopping or whatever you want to call it. That is fun. That is fun. Look at that. Friendly foes. I, I look forward to reading this one. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to have fun with this article. Yeah, and James Longstreet really did suffer for his friendship with Grant, also with his, his very principled stance. He was not one of the lost cause people. He was the one that said, we've lost. This is the way it is now, and we need to provide people their rights, and I will defend it. And he became a Republican, and oh my God, he was vilified in the South. They hated him, and they, they tried to blame Gettysburg's the loss on Gettysburg on Longstreet. We all know that, that old chestnut. Lee lost Gettysburg. Let's be clear, as Obama would say. <laughs> Let's be clear. I just got the new spring issue the other day, and I pulled off the sticker and I kind of ripped a little bit, but this looks good. 
partners in war, and that is uh, obviously General uh, George Armstrong Custer and his wife Libby. Um, it's just a fun magazine, and always giving. I love the uh, the books, the books and authors section. That looks really great. Inside Lincoln's cabinet, the Civil War diaries of Sam and P. Chase. Oh. Ooh, who is, I might have to get my hands on that. Um, let's see here. We've got, yeah, look at some of these pictures of the, um, are these the wives? Yes, I love this. I, did, I recently did, a, I showed a book on, um, about um, Lincoln's general's wives or something like that. And a few of these are in here, but look at how they colorize these 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 pictures. This is the wife of Robert E. Lee, and she's never looked so human. And look at that. Um, we've got, I don't know who these people are. Okay. This was the wife of Stonewall Jackson. Right here. Um, what, what a lovely... Oh, yeah. That was his second wife. Okay, here's Libby. She was a looker. Everyone loved Elizabeth Bacon Custer. He was in love with her, but I think he also kind of um, cheated on her out west with the uh, Native American ladies. <laughs> um, Libby. Anyway, uh, a fun... And well written, I should say, not just fun. It's it's a really uh, it, it, this magazine attracts some of the best writers out there, and it covers. I mean, Gary Gallagher, I think, is is on the masthead. Um, ooh, I might need to read this when I finally get to Gettysburg. I can plan out my my stay there, three days in Gettysburg. Uh, anyway, check out that. And this video is super long. Um, and then three. The three magazines I subscribe to and I have for, gosh, I feel like it's been forever. Maybe 15 years, maybe 20. I don't know. 15 years at least. Could be 17 years. Um, the folks in Netherlands, in the Netherlands, the Karawansere Car Press. Or not, yeah. I subscribed, I have been subscribing to Ancient Warfare forever. This is their brand new um, issue. In the land of the enemy, the challenges of campaigning. They always s still find new things to say. Uh, they have updated their design over time. It's gotten far more graphic, graphically um, busy, but in a good way. The articles are still uh, very easy to follow. They're not overly academic, but um, and of course you know I love the <laughs> I love the artwork in the centerpiece. I love it. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on in these, but they're always they're always enjoyable. They're easy on the eyes. Um, and then I also subscribe to Ancient History. This is their latest one. Pop Prowess, Power, and Popularity, Hunting and Hunters in Antiquity. Similar design. They've got the, the bar timeline on the side. You know. Uh, this one focuses just on Ancient History. Uh, it could have warfare. It could not. It, it covers... Um, Culture, food, fat, you know, the hunt for elephants, you know, the whole article on the pachyderms. Um, and look at this. This is what I'm talking about. What? A a hippopotamus. A hippopotami? They are, um, they will F you up, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> and then this one, which was, used to be medieval warfare. And so I was a little bit. Uh, I won't say concerned, but I was like, they decided to change their focus, and they so they rehauled the magazine, and the, the new name is um, they've made ten issues of this under the 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 new name now. It's it's medieval world culture and conflict, so it includes elements of medieval warfare, but they also wanted to include culture, which you know what I'm okay with that. And, and this is their most recent one: uh, followers of Benedict, religion, ritual, and reform. Uh, and this fits in well with Historathon Q2, uh, which, which is from 500 to 1500, 
AD. Uh, we're not going to talk about the 1177 book that I showed in the last video because, um, yeah, we're just not going to do that. <laughs> that was April Fools, right? Um, fools on me. But yeah. These are great. And I think they sell these at Barnes & Noble uh, book stands, the newsstands there. Look at this. A whole article on the people's beverage in Europe's Middle Ages. Beer and brewing. That is, it's just kind of fun. It takes you to it. I keep saying fun. Let me find another. It is, it is um, delightful. And uh, oh, thank you for hitting me in the head. Um, and again, always a nice piece of artwork in the centerpiece. I really enjoy these magazines. So I just, you know, wanted to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that in this video. I keep meaning to show you some of these really cool history magazines that come almost every day. I've got something new, a journal or a magazine coming. So I think that does it, guys. I think you're all up to date. It took an hour to kind of cover what I've been uh, reading and what I've finished and what I am reading um, since the last installment of this. So I guess it's about right in an hour video to cover two weeks of reading or whatever it was. It could have been three weeks. I don't know. I'm going to try to keep to the schedule, but uh, thanks for sticking with me. If you have for this long, uh, the girls are still sleeping and I don't blame them. I'm going to try to get outside and enjoy the last of the light and this, the uh, warm temperature. So I hope you're doing well where you are. Thanks for being here with me on the history shelf until next time. Bye.